Next on Garden Line, we learn a non-chemical way to control dandelions. Now there's uh, several different pullers out there. We can see they vary in their mechanism. Funding for Garden Line is provided in part by your membership and the Friends of South Dakota Public Broadcasting. And by Swiftel Communications. Hello and welcome to Garden Line. I'm Stephen Monk. Tonight on our show, we'll visit with an extension weed specialist who will demonstrate several tools that work for non-chemical dandelion control. And as always, our panel of lawn and garden experts are here to answer your questions with the most up-to-date information about gardening, lawn care, insects, trees, and a host of other lawn and garden related concerns. So get ready to call in. The phone number for you to call is one 866 595-SDSU. That again is 1-866-595-7378. Joining me in the studio to answer your questions is John Keycafer, Brookings County Extension Educator, David Graper, Extension Horticulturalist, Mike Mechnine, Extension Weed Specialist, and John Ball, Extension Forestry Specialist. Helping answer the phones tonight are the folks from the Brookings Area Master Gardeners. And remember, when you call in with your questions, please provide the phone volunteers with as much information as possible about your garden problem. Be ready to provide a description of the problem, when the problem first appeared, whether it's affecting any other surrounding plants, and moisture or and soil conditions that exist. But first off, we're going to go around the table here to hear from our panel on what is currently happening Starting with you, John Keycafer. Well, I brought in some uh, video of one of our most common insects. I shouldn't call it that, but one of our most popular insects and one that I think everyone knows. Brought in some footage of monarch butterflies here. And this is the time of year when we start seeing larger numbers of these butterflies moving around. They're out visiting flowers at this point. Within a few weeks now, we'll start seeing numbers of them aggregating in trees and getting ready to make that move south. And these are, like I say, probably our best known insect. Almost every school kid learns about metamorphosis through looking at these things and watching them go from caterpillar to pupa to adult. Despite that, there are some things about them that maybe aren't quite as well known. And one of these things is uh, their look-alike here. This is the viceroy butterfly. This is not a monarch. You can see that kind of uh, arcing band across the hind wings, and that shows it's a viceroy as opposed to a monarch. Monarchs don't have that band on there. They've got just the, the veins running through there. Neat thing about that, it was always presumed that the monarch was distasteful and the viceroy mimicked the monarch so that it wouldn't get eaten. Turns out both of them are a little bit distasteful. So at this time of year, we're getting ready to see what they call super generation of the monarchs where they'll get ready to fly south. They, in this part of the country, I'll go to Mexico for the winter and overwinter on a mountain there. And we're seeing some caterpillars now, some young caterpillars out there that are the larvae of this super generation. They're out feeding on these plants. If you are planning to plant gardens for monarchs, you know, some of the ornamental milkweeds do a great job of providing food for them. But it's not just about the adults either. The larvae will eat on them. And it's surprising how many people will call in and say, I planted these things for the butterflies, and now I've got caterpillars eating them. And they don't realize that it's the same caterpillar that's eating the plant that turns into the butterfly that they want. So if you are seeing these out there feeding on your milkweed plants, it's exactly what you want. If you think you're getting too many on your ornamental milkweeds and you want to move them off of there, you can try transferring some of those caterpillars by hand, you know, just picking them up and moving them onto another milkweed plant and, and hopefully you don't harm the caterpillar and you provide some food for them at the same time. 
Okay, very good. Now, some people do tag these, don't they? That's right. There's actually an organization. It's called Monarch Watch. The website for them is monarchwatch.org. And you can order the tags through them, and they describe on there how to rub the scales off in a specific part of the wing and attach that sticky tag on there, and then you submit the data on that tag, the number on the tag and where you tagged it and the date, and it goes into that website, and they keep a database on it. And if anyone recovers that, you will hear that someone found your monarch. Very good. Thank you, John. Dave, what do you have for us? Well, I brought you some images in of McCrory Gardens because this Friday afternoon and evening we have our annual garden party. I believe it's the 23rd annual garden party. And uh, it's going to start about 1 o'clock or so on Friday afternoon. We're going to start doing guided tours. Those are going to depart from the information shelter or the main parking lot. About every half an hour I'll be doing tours along with some of my crew and some of our staff. And uh, they'll show you around the gardens and you can get your questions answered and that sort of thing. Then about 5.30 or so, and we've got several things starting. We're going to start with the SDSU ice cream, which will be a, a real treat. I don't know what the weather's going to be like for sure. They're saying a chance of showers, but it sounds like the weather's going to be pretty good. So come on out and enjoy a wide variety of SDSU ice cream flavors. Uh, Murph and Friends Jazz Band will be starting up about that time as well. And one other thing that we've been doing for the last several years, we're going to have an iris and daylily sale. Uh, in fact, I had the crew out busy digging plants today, so we've got bags and bags of uh, iris and daylilies that we'll have available for sale. I also brought along a few images that I want to just go through fairly quickly, just showing you some of the sights and things that you might see at McCroy Gardens. This is what most people see and comment about McCroy Gardens and say, oh, the gardens look beautiful this year. And while well, they're talking about this corner of 6th and 22nd Avenue, and a lot of people don't come in and venture in to see what the rest of the gardens look like. But uh, that, I think that garden looks especially good this year. Another view of it, we have a lot of uh, plants on trial this year. This is featuring a bunch of different kinds of sweet potato vines. Uh, we have uh, a wide variety of plants from proven winners, and these are some of their selections. The next slide, uh, this is the year of the zinnia. And each year, the National Garden Bureau picks a flower and a vegetable. And this year, it happens to be the zinnia. So our leaf bed, logo bed, we planted on different kinds of zinnia this year. So that bed is uh, pretty much in full bloom right at this moment. Uh, speaking of other trial plants, these are some of the other trial plants in that same area. This is in, uh, in between AA1 and AA2, the variety of coleus and petunias and some other plants mixed in there. Really some great displays with some of those plants this year. And speaking of the AS trial beds, here they are. Uh, we've got quite a few different varieties of plants in there. This year we incorporated some other regular trial plants in there besides just the AAS trials, but we've got some colia or some uh, cannas and some, uh, a variety of other plants that are really looking good this year in the trials. Next slide shows a few more of those trial plants. Uh, these are some that are really getting a lot of comments. That one on the left is a type of papyrus called King Tut. It's supposed to get six to eight feet in height. Right now it's about five feet or so. Really a plant that a lot of people kind of walk up to and say, well, what in the world is this thing? A uh, pretty interesting plant, an annual for us here in South Dakota. The next few images uh, are just some other areas within the garden. Uh, Mike or John was just showing some uh, pictures of some monarch caterpillars and butterflies and so forth. This is a scene from our butterfly garden, which is just overrun with uh, echinacea this year. Uh, this is one of the last several years we've had a lot of trouble with little weevils, the sunflower head clipper weevils that have been chewing off the heads of the echinacea. This year I don't think I've seen a single one yet, so the echinacea are just looking gorgeous this year. Here's a few other trial plants, a uh, special type of cleome, kind of a dwarf bushy cleome with some other plants there in the background. This is our geranium garden this year. Uh, we've had, with the wet weather, had a buildup in disease in our uh, annual geraniums that we typically plant in this garden, so we decided to take a break and do some crop rotation. And kind of literally, we're rotating the crops this year because our garden is kind of planted in a spiral. So we've got a variety of interesting plants planted in that area. This is in the perennial garden. Uh, the rudbeckia here is in full bloom. You can see the fountain there in the background. And you really can't see it in this image, but off to the north of right where this image was taken, you'll be able to see our new information and our education and visitor center. Uh, we aren't going to be doing tours of that, but you'll be able to see that from a little bit of a distance. There's the red garden, looking pretty good this year. There's kind of a sideways image of some of the coleus. I think this variety is called the henna. 
a really neat uh, looking plant. And I wanted to show you a picture of our crew. This is the, these are the people that make it all happen at McCrory Gardens. Uh, everything from the planting and weeding and watering to uh, sweeping the sidewalks and all those kinds of things. So when you come out to the garden party and you see some of these folks in those green shirts, please stop and thank them and tell them that you appreciate what they did because they have been working really hard this summer. A little bit smaller crew this year with some of the budgetary issues, but uh, doing a pretty good job. And there's a picture of the new building as it looked uh, last week. A little bit closer shot, you can see uh, most of the siding is now up. The roof is pretty much done. They're working on some of the columns and pillars and so forth. And I got a couple images. Uh, there's a back view. You can see the shade structure in the back of the great hall there in the center of the image. So it's really coming along pretty nice. And this is a view inside. This is inside the great hall. You can see the people up there on the lift in the back so you can get some idea of how big it is. But lots of exposed wood inside the building. It's really going to be a beautiful place for you to come on out and, and uh, have a special event or just come on out and visit the garden. So again, this Friday, starting about 1.30 and uh, going until about dusk. Sounds like a good, uh, good time. And the visitor center is coming right along, and you mentioned they're looking at a November? About the 1st of November hoping. it should be completed. We'll be doing uh, kind of the majority of the major landscape plants and so forth will be going in this fall. We'll try to get the trees and shrubs in. We'll be doing some of the herbaceous uh, landscape installation yet in the spring. Okay. You mentioned the ornamental um, sweet potatoes. Mm -hmm. And we have a question that comes in every now and then as far as they do get little fruit or tubers, tubers on those. Yep. And if those are edible or not. They are edible. Uh, it's just a funky colored sweet potato that somebody at some point realized, hey, this is a pretty neat ornamental plant. So yeah, if you dig them, dig them up in the fall or they freeze and you're, you're done with the garden and you happen to find some of those, you can go ahead and eat them. I can't guarantee you the flavor is going to be all that great because they're just, they're grown for their ornamental characteristics now, but uh, they are edible. Okay. Thanks, Nate. Mm -hmm. Mike, what do you have for us in the... Uh Weed world. Well, speaking of nice flowers and that sort of thing, another uh, common weed is starting to flower, and that's wild cucumber. Uh, this is a weed that catches people's attention because it vines up on trees and that sort of thing, and it looks scary, uh, but it's really not that much of a threat. Uh, and with the wet conditions we've been having lately, this, that really has promoted the growth of wild cucumbers. So you may be seeing this around. Uh, in the next photograph, we'll see that uh, it's generally right now kind of in the flowering stage. And so it's those white flowers that might really catch your attention when you're driving down the road and you see this all over a tree. Now pretty soon in the next uh, photograph, we'll see the cucumber uh, that uh, is not tasty at all, uh, probably worse tasting than uh, John's monarch uh, butterflies. Uh, <laughs> plus those spikes are quite a deterrent as well. So very bitter, uh, horrible tasting plant, but it does get kind of a neat cucumber type um, gourd on it. Uh, in the last photograph, uh, another picture of, of the flowering plant uh, as we might see it uh, about this time of the year. So uh, you might see it around, not a big threat, not easy to control. A lot of people ask, how do I control this? Well, it's an annual, and so you never really know where it's going to pop up. Uh, you know, you really, and you certainly can't spray it, you know, you can't spray into the tree. And so just clipping it, that sort of thing at the base will, will kill it. So uh, wild cucumber, not a big threat, but one that might catch your attention. Mm -hmm. And John, maybe you can help here too, but uh, you'd mentioned as far as it really doesn't kill the trees, it grows mainly on trees that are already dead? Well, or, or can it shade out a living tree to where it causes detriment to that tree? Very little. By the time this thing is in full leaf, the trees have already had half a season ahead of them. So it's really not going to harm trees. It's, most of the time if it's on a dead tree, it wasn't the cause of its death. But just cutting it off from its source of yeah, food? Yeah, if you can go out there with a mower or clipper or something like that, just cut it off and that, that'd take care of it. All right, good. John, looks like you brought us a little snack here. You bet, yep. you bet. And uh, what I have is uh, some of the beginnings of our fall uh, raspberries. Uh, fall bearing, which uh, are one of the easiest ones to grow. All you have to do is, in the wintertime, cut all the stems of the ground and these come up. And you can get a second summer crop, but I don't recommend it. Uh, just cut them all to the ground this, this winter, give them a little lime sulfur in the spring just before bud break to uh, cut down any disease problems. And we're already picking. And this is a pint of Autumn Bliss, which is actually one of my favorites. These will keep uh, producing until our first hard frost. So I'm good for about another month or so. 
uh, with us, and the production's pretty good. We can get about a quart per linear foot on these, and it's uh, one of my favorites. However, you know, I did bring a, another one here, Mike, you know, for, for those of you that prefer something else. A little greenery to go. A little <laughs> greenery to go. Now, you know, last week we talked about eating weeds. And, you know, we could ask our viewers, what would they prefer tonight? And so I'm going to pass both these around, and we'll see which one lasts the evening. <laughs> so with that, have some raspberries. <laughs> raspberries are good, but I might prefer this purslane. So this is purslane that John brought in that we, for the viewers that we uh, talked about eating last year. Uh, not bad. Uh, it does get a leaf miner commonly that... Uh, I, I don't know how that tastes. I, not doesn't have add too much taste, but uh, you want to watch out for that. But uh, purslane is not a bad uh, alternative. If you don't have raspberries out there, uh, you always have purslane to go on. It came out of my goat pen, Mike. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> Goats are fine, too. I did actually <laughs> clean this stuff before I brought it in, just in case. Yeah. This <laughs> might just add protein. That's true. Right. Yeah. That's true. It shouldn't hurt you any. So anyway, <laughs> lots of goodies to eat and munch on this time of year. You like that? It's not bad. <laughs> A real salad bar right here. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> John, you mentioned as far as pruning those down, and, mm -hmm. and this worked for me uh, as far as just using my lawnmower, setting it up a little higher as far as pruning those down. Is that? Have you ever done that? Or? No, I haven't done that. I, I got a feeling I'd have a discussion with somebody else if I took our lawnmower out there. But, uh, okay. you know, actually just going out there with shears doesn't That's take true. that long. We've got about, uh, what I think, uh, 1,500 linear feet of these, uh, three feet wide, and it still doesn't take that long. And, and the, the goats love them when we cut them. Uh, they'll chow down the whole thing. The other thing, too, and we've had a lot of calls on this, people saying, well, the raspberries are dying. The, the fruit formed the summer and then mummified. And there's a lot of problems with cane blight. One of the nice things is with the fall bearing, you have less problems with that because in the fall, you cut all the canes down and destroy them. So you don't have any overwintering sites. Destroy? For you mean by take them off site or? Yep, just burn <laughs> them, destroy them in some way, okay. or rake them, them. The or feed them to the goats, right? Which are happy with them. Uh, but I, you know, I tell you, there's really no easier crop, and I think you have some too, Dave, than a fall-bearing raspberry. And there's some uh, autumn bliss is one of my favorite. Autumn Britain is another one, and and the best, which hasn't really started producing for us yet, is fall gold. It is literally like eating cubes of sugar. Uh, it doesn't last more than about three days. It doesn't transport well, but it only has to go from here to here. So <laughs> the distance isn't far, but if you really want a good one. Uh, do you have any fall gold? I don't, but I've enjoyed them for many years, and, and you get that nice, cool fall weather. It just kind of intensifies that sweetness, and, oh, they are good. Yeah, yep. so good. plant raspberries. Thank you, John. So, Well, let's get to some of the questions that have already started to come in, and this comes to us from Gettysburg Tomatoes. Uh, Dave, tomatoes are six foot tall, green tomatoes aren't ripening. How can she trim the tomatoes so the tomatoes ripen? Well, I wouldn't really do anything with them. Uh, if you wanted to cut the tops off of some of those plants to discourage any additional flowers formation, you could do that. But you just need to be patient. I know that's hard when you're hungry for fresh tomatoes and you got those green fruit out there. There are some recipes for green tomato dishes you might check out some of those if you just can't wait but just give them time uh, we've had a lot of questions this summer about plants not flowering and plants not setting fruit and then fruit not ripening it's just a matter of being patient and if you got good fruit set you should have good things to come so just hold off and wait okay this one comes to us from harriet uh john raspberries or dave raspberries are small and fall apart when picked what might be the problem with that and we've got like four questions here. We'll just go one at a time. Well, if they're mummified, we're probably looking at cane blight. But if they're just falling apart, you know, one of the problems I've seen, Dave, though this may not be the case, is if people over-fertilize them, that aggregate fruit, I mean, you're really looking at our example, hey, A here, of just a lot of small little berries put together, if you will. And I found if you give them high nitrogen, the fruit falls apart. Uh, fairly commonly. So too much water will do that too, and we've had that. But any other possibilities? Well, there is a disease called crumbleberry, mm -hmm. which I believe is a viral right. uh, disease. Uh, that could be a problem. If you're seeing that throughout your patch, uh, then uh, leaning more towards some of the things that John mentioned. But if you got a plant here and there that's doing it, probably within an area, then that could be what the disease is. Uh, also, poor fertilization of those flowers can also lead to fruit that are not real crumbly, so are not real solid. So, if you're 
they're not the fruit don't seem to be really fully formed there aren't a lot, as many of the little berries as you should as you should see in a multiple fruit like that could be some pollination issues but um, I think in, you know too much fertilizer too much water uh, the crumble berry disease are probably the most likely situations well, that there. crumble berry too though do you often get the very a little variegation to the leaf too or you do a little yeah, bit yeah you usually get you just a little line on the foliage but you're right too that seems to be just a plant or two and if you get in there and cut them out as low as you can usually you can keep Actually, it just try to pull those out i yeah. would say because you can't get rid of the virus yeah okay. uh the second uh, part of this this question that came in deals with tomatoes and there's three different types of questions but might lend themselves a little bit to what you talked about maybe over fertilization uh, the plants in the garden and they're talking about tomatoes are huge but slower than their neighbors as far as really setting fruit a lot of vines uh, what should I do the next question is tomatoes when should I clip the suckers and can I clip new growth on tomato vines to help produce more fruit so three questions all related to, to uh, tomatoes there well I think you're maybe a little bit late to try to do much with the suckers uh, and removing those and I personally I think that's kind of a controversial issue of removing those suckers if that really helps or doesn't um, I think if you got a nice big healthy plant and it's not been over fertilized I think that's probably your best chance of getting a good crop of fruit but if you did over fertilize and put too much nitrogen on we often caution people to wait until they start getting fruit set before they give a little side dressing of nitrogen but if you put on a heavy dose of nitrogen initially and then plant it you can get that big huge plant and often that may be at the cost of not having as much fruit so again all you can do is be patient and as I mentioned if you want to cut the tips off some of those stems to prevent additional flowering you can do that you're going to give up a little bit of yield potentially but you might hasten those other fruit to come a little bit right come faster to write them okay well every week we do encourage our viewers if they have questions or pictures to uh, go ahead and email those in and uh, we're going to start with some of those right now uh, the first one I have here comes to us from Rapid City and it's an insect one John uh, key Kafer. I'm wondering what kind of insects these are there are hundreds of those swarming on our deck ants of all sizes and winged insects of all sizes uh, the winged ones uh, did not fly. Are they beneficial or harmful? They are crawling in between cracks on the deck and next to my house. Yeah, well, uh, honestly, these are all ants, the winged ones and the wingless ones. The winged ones are the reproductive ants. We've got some larger ones with wings, which are the new queens coming out of that nest, and some smaller ones with wings, which are the males. For anybody who doesn't know anything about the rest of ants, all of those that you see without wings running around are females. Most of them are workers. They simply don't have wings because they don't need them. When a queen mates and, and gets off to a new place to start a, a new colony, she cuts her wings off and, and uh, starts that colony there and they end up producing a lot of workers. As far as whether or not they're beneficial, most of our ants around here, at least to some degree, can be considered beneficial. They're largely predatory on other insects and the function that they serve in gardens and in lawns and in other places like that is one of first being predators. They do a little pollination of some flowers. Um, they do aerate soil quite nicely in some locations too. And so they are serving a beneficial role in the environment. And if you can leave them alone and live with them, that's probably the best thing. In a case like on the deck, you may want to treat those nests directly if you really are bothered by them there. But uh, otherwise, those that aren't flying at that time, they probably came out of the nest and discovered that it was too cold to really get up in the air and fly. So now, the, crawl the around. ones, I usually get calls or samples in people thinking they have termites. So right. why don't you tell them the difference between a, so they can look and tell it's a termite or an ant? Well, that one's easier said than done. I know. But uh, <laughs> you know, honestly, the best way to tell the difference is that an ant has four wings, two larger ones in front and two smaller ones that are linked to those larger front wings in the back. And so they'll look kind of like two large wings, but you can actually see they are separated out into the two. Termites have four equal sized wing. The name for the order, Isoptera, means four equal wings or equal winged insect. And so um, when you see those with those equal wings, they've got a real heavy vein on the leading edge, and then they're usually kind of a, a milky white color around here. Those are termites. And they get called winged ants by a lot of people. They're not ants at all. They are termites in that case. These with the wings like this that are generally going to be very clear, they may reflect light like in that image, but they are generally clear in color. Um, 
those are our ants, the reproductive ants that you see moving. Okay, and ants are three-segmented? Well, yes, actually all insects have a head, thorax, and abdomen. Usually the ants have a very constricted waist, so to speak, that petiole that goes between the abdomen and the thorax is usually quite constricted. Termites don't have that, but seeing that requires you to pick them up and look at them pretty closely. Mm -hmm. And this is the time of year when you get kind of a still, warm, humid night where swarming tends to take place? Right, yeah, they go off and they find a place, uh, usually above a hillside or something like that, and they form these mating columns in the air. And uh, it's a case of female choice. The males you know, fly around and the females hang around the outside and pick out the males that look most appealing to them. All right, okay. Uh, the next one we have here comes to us from Sioux Falls, and it's another insect one, John. Uh, these insects are inside the home, outside the home. They've seen them as gray colors, sometimes they're black. They've put a barrier spray around. Uh, will they cause any damage? How do I control these? And they're not the only ones. It sounds like other folks in the neighborhood have them as well. One of our more common insect questions at this time of year, and the color difference here is actually a difference in species, and we're actually dealing with two different genera. These grayish ones like this one here are Calomicteris, uh, Cetarius, this is the imported longhorn weevil. Common insect here in South Dakota now, just like the name says, they are imported. They feed on a wide range of plants, mostly clovers and other legumes. The adults can't fly, so they crawl into places. The black ones that you're seeing in the homes as well are the strawberry root weevils, Odiorhynchus ovatus uh, is the, the name on those. And, and similarly, they're in the same family, they're both weevils. The strawberry root weevil cannot fly either, and so they just crawl into the home. And um, In this case, that's exactly what's going on. They crawl in more or less to see what's there, maybe try to find a place to find some shelter, but won't do any harm in the home. Okay, the next one comes to us from Peter, Dave. Uh, they bought some uh, tomato plants at the local farmer's market, and they were labeled as Empire. Uh, however, the plants are planted in self-watering container, constructed out of livestock mineral tubs, about four foot in, in diameter. Uh, they were planted in May. The plants are located in full sun along the driveway, and they notice this model-type coloring to the tomatoes about a week and a half ago. Um, they've also been struggling a little bit with blossom end rot in some of their plants, if that has any relation to this or not. At least one nearby plant has no fruit, but a few blossoms. A nearby cherry tomato plant is doing quite well. Any thoughts or comments on what they may have here and if, is there anything they can or should do? Well, I think they also mentioned in there that they thought it might be tomato ring spot virus or tomato necrotic ring spot virus or impatience necrotic ring spot virus. One of those, you know, there's several of them that all sound about the same, but I think that's what you're dealing with here is a viral infection with this plant. Uh, impatience necrotic ring spot virus is one of those diseases that will attack just about anything. And uh, depending on where these were grown, if there were some old plants that might have been in the greenhouse, they can be infected and carriers of it. It spreads by uh, insects from one plant to another. And I think that's what you're dealing with here. So uh, you've got a viral problem as far as, I think the other part of the question was, are the tomatoes edible? I think they are edible. I don't think there's any problem with eating them. I don't know if the flavor is going to be affected by that uh, disease or not, but um, you shouldn't have that mottled, funky look to those fruit. I think that tomato variety is supposed to be more of a solid red color, so there's definitely something wrong there. Okay. Uh, the next one comes to us from Canton, and they have here for John Ball, but Mike, I think it fits into what you talked about just a little bit ago. They have an ivy growing on their spruce trees. Looks like Creeping Charlie. Almost covers some of the trees. What is it and what can they do for it? Yeah, boy, that yeah, looks like Creeping Charlie. That kind of th throws me a little bit. But uh, yeah, I, wild cucumber is probably the most common vine uh, vining up on the trees right now. Uh, you might have bindweed, Creeping Jenny uh, on there as well, but um, I don't know if there's any other no, that, vining. That makes sense to me. That, I was, when, they, when they said that, it kind of, okay. You know, what could it be? But I think it is a cucumber. But it's getting it, that big. 
I don't think I've ever seen Creeping Jenny get that far up into a tree. Yeah, right, right. And certainly not Creeping Charlie. No. <laughs> There's some nasty Creeping yeah, Charlie. That's a yard I don't want to see. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> but yeah, just as he said, just cut it. I mean, it's spruce make a real handy platform to, to hang on to, but it's not harming the spruce. And it's not going to eventually invade and get worse. Really, it usually stays fairly localized, even though sometimes it can, you know, there can be several plants. It's not something that it's is going to get on. Kudzu right now. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yep. All right. Uh, John, this one comes to us from Rapid City. Uh, they have a Redmond linden tree, very tall, tipping over, approximately 10 feet tall, but the top two to three feet is tipping. Slender, not very strong. Uh, they planted it this spring. How can I straighten out the top that is flopped kind of over? Also two branches, one side are drooping. Uh, want them to grow up rather than down. Um, and they live on a windy site. Any ideas, suggestions? All right. Well, first of all, Redmond Linden is a good choice. It's uh, for all our Nebraskan viewers. It's a Nebraskan plant back in the uh, late 30s, early 40s, and so it's adapted well to uh, South Dakota. It is a little tippy when it's young. Uh, to get the tips to kind of bend just a bit and even droop on the ends is fairly common. However, in time, those branches tend to turn upwards on the end. So I frankly wouldn't do anything with the side branches. You're going to find they turn out just fine. The top, I'd probably not do anything either because they sometimes do droop a little bit. If you're really concerned, sometimes you can t put a dowel next to them to, to hold them straight up. The danger to that is, too, one, you forget about it, and then after a year or two, you've got a dead top because now the, uh, the cord has strangled it. Second of all, that actual swaying motion actually helps strengthen the stem. So if you're, my best advice would be probably do nothing this fall. Find something else to do. Uh, and next summer, if it's still droopy, well, then use the tomato steak to, to help straighten up the stem. But I think you're going to find that it recovers on its own. They tend to be a little droopy when they're young. What the heck? Just make sure they take that, whatever they use to fasten that steak on, they're off after a year? Oh, I'd or do it by the fall. fall. I mean, you know, put it on, by winter comes, take it off. Uh, but, you know, it's amazing how many times people say, well, I'll get to that, I'll get to that. Mm -hmm. Well, they, for five years, they're going to get to it. Well, it's dead. Don't have to do it now. So. Okay. so. So Thank that's you. a last resort. Thank you, John. So, while frequently we get questions about non-chemical control solutions for lawn and garden problems, GardenLine follows extension weed specialist Mike Meckning, who demonstrates several tools used to control dandelions, commonly known as dandelion diggers. I'm SDSU Extension Weed Specialist Mike Meckning. I'm here today to talk about dandelion pullers for a non-chemical control of dandelions in your lawn. Now there's a, several different pullers out there. Uh, we, we can see they vary in their, their mechanisms, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, some twist, some pry, uh, but they all kind of follow the same concept. The bottom line that you really need to be thinking about when you're considering a dandelion puller is depth. We know we need, a, we need I, from personal experience, two inches is not enough. You need to probably get about three quarters or all that root if possible. So when you're considering dandelion pullers, look at the length of the tines. That's generally about as much root as you're gonna get. So let's give it a shot here real quick. This is the old grandpa's weeder. There's a lot of variations of this on the market. We just pry it in. We got a little lever there. We just lean back. And this is moist soil, so this is pretty easy conditions for a dandelion puller. But here we pull this out and we see we only got about an inch of root on this dandelion. So that's clearly not enough for this size dandelion. That dandelion is gonna come back. We got some different type pullers out there. We've got twisters. We've got uh, more complicated mechanisms uh, to pull these out, but they follow the same concept. These tines are just too short. Now we've got the old dandelion popper, much longer tines on this dandelion popper. So right away we can tell we're probably gonna get a little bit more root with this thing. This was common on the marketplace several years ago, uh, and I, I found that it actually doesn't work too bad. You just spear those prongs in at the base and pop it right on out, and it, uh, it does a pretty nice clean job of pulling things out. Now a lot of times I can get a sizable amount of root, but here, uh, maybe a quarter of an inch, not enough, that dandelion's gonna come back. So although the dandelion popper may be a little better than some, it's still not gonna cut it on many dandelions. 
And the last tool we'll talk about today is this corkscrew type mechanism. Here right away though we can see we've got a fairly good length so we it looks like we ought to be able to get uh, a large amount of root with this type of tool. So let's give it a try and, and see what we can get. Now it's a lot of labor with this one. You gotta poke it in and screw it down. It's got a short handle so that makes things a little bit difficult as well. And then we'll pull this out. You can see we took, uh, took quite a bit of soil with this, uh, with this puller. Screw it out here and see what we got for root. But here we break away this soil and we got a lot of root on this. Now we, there's a little bit of a tip that broke off, but this might be good enough here to kill this dandelion. See the old corkscrew puller might work. It's going to leave a pretty big hole. So there are some different tools out there, a lot of different options. The bottom line is, is look to see how much you can get uh, out of, for that root out of the soil. You've got to get more than two inches. So different options for non-chemical dandelion control in your yard. Well, thank you for that information, Mike. Is there any follow-up comments you want to make about any of those? Or? No, and as I kind of mentioned, you know, the, the efficacy is marginal on them, but it's, it's an alternative out there, and, and with a little labor and a little dedication, you can get on top of those dandelions. And probably moist soils would work a little better than the dryer. Certainly helps. So okay. what a great year for dandelion yeah. pullers. Yeah, okay, good, thank you. Well, let's go back to some of the questions that have come in to us online. Uh, we have a flowering shrub picture here is, is this is what they call it anyway uh, the plant is a, a bush about four foot high is what they say it is in flowering uh, condition right now very showy very delicate white petals extremely fragrant uh, I have not seen had any success loading, locating it with plant finders or online type uh, resources would truly love to get my own specimen plant for home or wondering if a cutting this time of year from the shrub could be propagated into my own home planting. Uh, should it be hardwood or softwood? Any thoughts, ideas? Well, I'm pretty sure that what we're dealing with here is not actually a shrub, but a herbaceous plant. This is saponaria or bouncing bet, and there's a number of other common names that you'll see with it. It does make a pretty good sized bushy plant though, so I could see where you might suspect that it might actually be a shrub. As far as propagating it, uh, this will readily produce seed after those flowers have faded. You'll see little seed capsules up there. Wait till those turn brown and dry. Just collect some of those and scatter the seed where you want to grow it in your own home. And you should have bouncing bet bouncing all over your yard. <laughs> it's, uh, we've got it in a lot of areas in McCroy Gardens. We've been pulling it out, trying to get rid of it. Oftentimes the flowers have more of a pinkish tinge to them or even a kind of a lavender tinge to them. It's just pure white. But uh, bouncing bet, sapping area, Kind of a neat little perennial plant, but one that uh, can be quite pretty and can be a little invasive sometimes, too. <laughs> okay. Uh, the next one comes to us from Freeman, uh, John Keekafer. They have a couple pictures here. Squash bugs or maybe something else have started hitting my squash plants again this year. And the picture is an acorn squash with the life being sucked out of it, is what they say. <laughs> I have seen the whitish squash bugs lately. How do I stop them from migrating to my other plants? What insecticide will kill them? How do I stop them from coming back next year? And they, they do follow on to say here that they really don't care for these bugs. So. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, well, most of our squash <laughs> bugs are kind of a dusky brown color, kind of a dirt color. And uh, if you truly have squash bugs, that's probably what you're dealing with. Um, a lot of our insecticides um, don't work as well as what people would like on squash bugs, unfortunately. It's not that they're ineffective against them, it's just bugs are hard to kill. They're hiding in places where it's hard to get a spray at them or a powder at them, and they're stabbing their mouth parts into the plants to feed rather than chewing on leaves, and so you really need a systemic type insecticide, and if you're gonna harvest squash anytime soon, you don't want a systemic insecticide on those plants. So in that case, your best bet is probably gonna be hand picking for them and just try to keep them off that way. Rotation is really key on that as far as getting rid of them for the next year and doing as much sanitation as you can and even some deep tillage to try to uh, churn up some of those eggs and, and uh, destroy them uh, this fall and maybe again next spring, try to get rid of them that way. 
Okay. The second picture they have included here is uh, dealing with cucumbers that are turning brown. Uh, they've received plenty of water. Do you think it's an insect or disease? And they just appreciate some insight there if the picture can, can help us out. So. Well, I noticed, it look, does look like we have some powdery mildew uh, showing up on some of the foliage there. Uh, another thing that we might have going on here, and I can't really see very well with the pictures, we could have some bacterial wilt showing up with uh, the cucumbers. It's pretty common in cucurbits, if they recall maybe seeing some of the little yellow and black striped beetles that were feeding on the plants earlier. If they saw that, this would be a good indication that probably you do have the bacterial uh, wilt, which is a disease that gets into the plants and kind of clogs up the vascular tissue in the plants just when it gets hot just can't get enough water out to those stems and they start wilting. So a couple things going on there. If, if it's just the white powdery appearance to the plants, that's the powdery mildew. And again, the high humidity levels that we've had um, are very conducive to that sort of a problem. Really not much you can do about it at this point in the season. Okay. Uh, John Keekafer again, this one comes from Huron. This caterpillar was in their grass today. Can you ID it for me? It was two and a half to three inches long. Pretty big, pretty big around too. Had a spot, spot on one end that looks like a big eye. Yeah, and that probably is the head that you're seeing on that. This is one of the sphinx moths or hawk moth caterpillars. Uh, it looks like it's probably Eumorpha is the genus on it, and uh, Achaemon sphinx is the common name for this one. Feeds on Virginia creeper and grapes and other plants like that, uh, and so you're likely seeing it on some of those. As far as wandering in this case, it may be headed off to try to form its pupal case and, and pupate. And with a lot of these, if they're really wandering a distance from any food that they might have been feeding on, there's a good chance that they're parasitized by a small wasp. And when they parasitize them that way, the wasp larvae in the caterpillar causes the caterpillar to change behavior. And they wander off to habitats that are more favorable for those wasps and does nice things for them that way rather than going where the caterpillar would want to go. So if you were to keep it and try rearing it out, you may find that instead of getting a nice big moth out of it, you get a whole bunch of little wasps. Okay. Mind control. Huh? Yeah, mind control <laughs> through you know, alien type taking yeah, over a body. Just like the movie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the next one comes to us from, from T. And the image here is, uh, what in the world is this? The stems are coming out of the same spot as the red potato mounds. The leaves look exactly like potato leaves. The stems are just as thick and look no different. What are they? Well, we've got kind of a classic question. We get this question probably a few times every summer. These are potato fruit, and I think we'll get the image up there shortly, but you'll see little ball-like structures developing up on the, tomato, or the potato stems, and those are just the fruit of potato. Uh, typically, we grow potatoes from seed pieces, from the, the tubers, but they will develop seeds sometimes. In fact, there were uh, one or two varieties of potatoes that you can grow from seed like you would tomatoes. But every once in a while you'll see a few of those fruit develop on the plants. Don't worry about them. They're nothing to be concerned about. Just something kind of a curiosity. And the, the, the seeds themselves are no real value. I wouldn't try yeah, to do anything work. with the seeds, yeah. no. Okay. Uh, follow up part of that. Or, okay, there's there the image go. there if you there want to refer to that. So They look like little tiny tomatoes. Yep. And so. But don't treat them like little tomatoes. Yeah, don't try to eat them. Right. Okay. Uh, also, they would like to know when is the best time or how do you tell when it's time to pick watermelon? They have both sugar babies and, and a large variety of variegated light and dark green striped varieties. Some of the sugar babies are as big, if not bigger, than a volleyball, and the other variety is at least two times bigger than the basketball, if not more. Well, that's kind of an art, and you have to kind of get used to it and get lucky once in a while and when I try it I usually end up picking one or two in the beginning that just aren't quite ripe yet. Several things you want to look at. Number one is you want to roll the fruit gently over onto, onto its side and look at the underside of where the fruit was sitting on the ground. You're going to see a different colored spot there. It's going to be either white or maybe yellow to orange. That's going to be much more prominent when that fruit is ripe. Uh, the next thing to do is look at the end of the stem where that, or the, where the end of the fruit where the stem is attached to it. There's going to be a curled up tendril there. That tendril should turn dry and brown, uh, another indication that that fruit is mature. And the last thing is the old thump test. 
You know, you rap on it and see if it sounds like it's hollow. And probably the best thing to do is to rap on several of the, the fruit in that area. And if all the other things look good, you got the ground spot, you got the dry tendril, and it seems like it's the hollowest sounding one of the mix, that'd be a good one to try and sample. Uh, and again, it just takes a little luck. And after you get the first one or two that are ripe, then pretty much most of them are going to probably be following along at the same time. But you get anxious for that first one, and sometimes you pick a little bit early, but those are the things to try. Okay. This one comes to us from uh, Viberg. Uh, I have cut down our hollyhocks because of what looked like stem rot or fungus that was spread throughout the plants, and now it seems to be starting on the marigolds. Should I pull the infected plants, or what would you suggest on this? Well, first of all, the hollyhocks, I believe what they have there is hollyhock rust. Uh, it's pretty much decimated the hollyhocks that we have at McCrory Gardens this summer. In fact, I had the crew just pull some of them out because they were just so badly disfigured with the rust. It was all over the leaves, on the stems. They just looked terrible, so we just pulled them out. That is a disease that overwinters on old debris that is diseased. So the best way to treat it, you can't really spray for it, but to just try to clean up all those old leaves. Uh, when the plant dies down this fall, just get in there with the pruning shears and cut all that stuff off and get it out of there. Uh, as far as the marigolds are concerned, I mentioned this a little bit earlier with the uh, cucumbers. This is kind of classic powdery mildew. It looks like this is maybe up next to a house or something. If it's an area that doesn't get real good air circulation, or if you've got an automatic sprinkler system and this area stays moist all the time, so it's high humidity, those are going to be conditions that are very conducive to the powdery mildew. Uh, the home remedy treatment for this is the old uh, baking soda treatment, a tablespoon of baking soda, teaspoon of dish soap or vegetable oil and a gallon of water. Shake that up really well, put it in a hand sprayer and spray the plants with it. But for those plants that are pretty much already covered with that white powdery uh, growth of the fungus, there's not going to be much that you can do about it for those. Okay. And I understand the uh, that home recipe uh, fungicide on the is on the website, yes, right. if they wanted to go there. So good. And the last one we have here is uh, one that comes to us from Crooks, South Dakota. Uh, these onions were planted from sprouts and sets. Uh, they've had some problems with these where they turn kind of mushy and at the junction of the bulb and the root. The smaller one uh, in the photo is completely soft. Um, they've had some problems with these this year and e even in the past year. So anything as far as soil treatment, what is causing it, what can they do to help prevent that? Well, my best guess here is that this is a fusarium basal rot, it's called. It attacks the basal plate, the place where all the little leaf and root, the leaves and roots all kind of join at the very bottom. When you cut open an onion, you get that little triangular piece at the bottom. That's the basal plate. Well, that gets infected with this fungus, and it just kind of rots it all out, rots off the roots. The plant wilts. Uh, it looks pretty bad. It doesn't store worth a darn because you got that infection inside the bulb. Uh, it's more common when we have very warm soils. So if you're in an area that's gotten kind of hot, that could be part of it. It does uh, overwinter in the soil, so crop rotation is going to be one of the best things that you can do to try to avoid problems with it. Uh, you mentioned starting with seed or with sprouts and, and that sort of thing. You might consider trying to grow uh, from seed next year. I think you're going to find you're going to get much better results, better plants, better onions, and you're going to eliminate that possibility of having some overwintering or some transmission of that disease from those old sprouts. So uh, you got a number of things going on there. I'd try to plant in a new spot next year, uh, keep that area uh, well watered during the summer, consider using a mulch around those plants. Hopefully you'll have some better luck. Mm -hmm. They said this is, uh, the site's been here for four years, but it, it was an old, it was a farm field. Mm -hmm. Not a feed lot, but a farm field. So if that makes any difference, probably yeah, just I'm more sure, coincidence, yeah. That's what it sounds like to me. Okay. Uh, the next one comes to us from Sioux Falls. Uh, they have curly chives. Are they edible or just ornamental? Well, the chives are edible. Uh, the curly chives is a little bit different than the typical straight chives that you see. Um, but really, most of those plants in that onion group are, are edible to a greater or lesser extent, depending on how strong or flavor they are. But uh, just, you know, start with a, a few, you know, worry about food allergies and those kinds of things sometimes. So just start with a few and see if you have any issues with them. If you don't, chive away. Okay. They also say here, John, she picked six golden raspberries today, so the plants are just starting to produce. That's great. So. That's great, yeah. Yeah, it's a little early, but hey, you know, you're getting a few. Okay. Uh, John and Mike, uh, 
When can you start replanting raspberries and can you use Roundup to kill the weeds first? Well, generally you want to start clean when you're doing anything, gardens or whatever. So starting clean is the way to go and yeah, absolutely, especially if you've got some turf or some perennial weeds out there, uh, quack grass, stuff like that. You definitely want to uh, clean it off uh, with a glyphosate product like Roundup. Um, you could plant, you know, I, I give it three days uh, to work in at, at the minimum. A week would be better, uh, and then yeah. you go for your raspberries. But actually, I would go one step further, and, and honestly, gosh, it makes a difference, and that is kill it off this fall, all right, till it, till it all next year, and then plant the following year. Because if you kill it off this fall and plant next spring, you're going to have a grass problem in there that's that's no tomorrow. But if you if you till it for a year, and I learned this from some other folks too, it really makes a difference. And I could show you rows where we just got a little anxious. So you can do it, but uh, then you're going to get into some, into some grass control, and, and you can talk about that here in a second. The other thing she said, replant raspberries. And no, it's kind of like strawberries. You're better off buying them, which are virus-free. Uh, don't go out and get somebody else's raspberries and move them. Go out and always buy them in the spring and start over. And and what would they use for grass control if they you know if they say oh I went to it and now I've got all this grass coming up in my raspberries. Yeah, there's just not very many options. And so yeah, I, I certainly agree with what John mentioned. I mean, the cleaner you can get that site, the better because yeah, keep in mind that once these weeds come in, there aren't very many options. Uh, there's suppression type things. Uh, if you're early enough, you know, I think there's like over the top or grass be gone that can suppress some grasses, especially annual grasses, only as it provides some suppression of perennials. Uh, Princep is, is an example of a herbicide that's fairly potent that will give you some grass activity and some broadleaf activity. But, you know, where are you going to buy Princep, you know, and, and things like over the top? I mean, these aren't common things. You'd really have to go out and hunt for some of these things. So bottom line is there's not very many good options. And say mulching is things you're going to want to do as well. I was going right? to ask as far as uh, you recommend mulch after uh, they plant them? Absolutely, you know, he said it right. These, these products suppress the grass. Yeah. They don't eliminate it. And so if you're standing up there, as I've seen some people, with grass this tall in the raspberries, good luck trying to chemically get rid of it. You know, start out as clean as you can, uh, use mulch, and honest to goodness, you're going to do some hand weeding in there too that first year. I noticed on the label there's different percents of solution for the, the Roundup type products. Is there one that you'd recommend to make sure they take care of, if they want to clean a place up, what percent they should use? Sure, a pretty follow? common question with a lot of these, and you really should look at the label and, and try to follow the rates because uh, these herbicides come in different concentrations, so rates vary quite a bit. Generally, we might say a two to five percent solution in water is kind of a rough approximation, so two to five percent solution, but certainly follow the label rates if you can. Okay, uh, from here on. Five apple trees, three years old. One of them has leaves turning light yellow and falling off. What causes this and how can she stop it? Well, leaves turning yellow is a symptom that we get with apple scab. Now, she should also see spotting on those leaves. They shouldn't be dropping clear yellow. But if she's seen these olive drab or dark spots throughout the apple and they're turning yellow, that's apple scab. And boy, have we seen that this year with all the rain. Uh, that can be managed, not controlled, but managed with fungicide sprays, but you got to start in the spring just at bud break, and if you skip that spray, you wasted your time on any others, and you're doing it about every two weeks. The other thing we're seeing is, again, if it's waterlogged soils, and if it's waterlogged soils that are alkaline, uh, we're seeing some of the leaves turning yellow on apples, too. So if they're clear yellow, it's probably a root issue, and that's waterlogged soils. If there's black spot in it, then it's apple scot. Okay. And we're seeing both. This one comes from Sioux Falls. John Key Kafer. Centipedes are moving into their house. How can she get rid of them? Uh, they scare her granddaughter. <laughs> okay. Well, first thing, you want to confirm that they're centipedes and not millipedes. We see a lot more millipedes coming into homes than centipedes. Centipedes are flattened. Legs tend to stick out to the sides a bit. Millipedes are more rounded, legs are on the bottom. Best way is to really try to seal up those entry points in the home. You know, make sure that the door sweeps are intact, make sure that the weather stripping around doors and windows is intact, and replace any of that that might have holes in it or be worn. Seal up any cracks in foundation or around windows, in siding, things like that, and, and try to keep them out that way. And beyond that, it's just a case of sweeping them up and throwing them out. You know, you're right on the ceiling, though. When we did 
we resetted the whole house. And so they took it all the way out, put new insulation on it, did that. Never seen another millipede centipede in it. If problem you, solved. Yeah, problem yeah. solved. Kind of expensive, but problem solved. I mean, it was kind of a yeah. nice added benefit. It was like, hey, the cats don't have anything to play with. Um, yeah, and they don't do any harm in right. them. They're just, they annoy people. Yeah, for the sake of the small child, they're, <laughs> they don't right, bother yeah. anything. But yeah, they're annoying. Yeah. And the uh, millipedes, if you touch them, they'll curl up like a coil of rope where the right. centipedes will just take the, off. If the you centipedes will try them. to run, yeah, yeah. And some of the centipedes will try to take a bite out of you if they can. Centipedes hunt down other insects. Great, now the kids. <laughs> uh, they're not going to hurt you too badly here. Too badly. <laughs> uh, real quick question here, Dave, from Bottle. Zucchini in the clusters are blooming for one month, but they're all male flowers. Is there anything they can do about that? Just try to maintain good growing conditions. If it gets dry, keep them well watered. Again, just be patient. It's just one of those things. Okay, great. Thank you. Well, that's all the time we have for this evening. Just to let you know, Garden Line does repeat twice each week on South Dakota Public Broadcasting Digital Channel 3, also known as the Create Channel. The Encore broadcast can be seen Fridays at 11 a.m. Central and Saturdays at 4 p.m. Central. Check your local listings to find SDPB Digital Channel 3 where you live. Now time to wrap up, and thanks to our panel of experts, John Keekafer, Brookings County Extension Educator, David Graper, Extension Horticulturalist, Mike Mechnine, Extension Weed Specialist, and John Ball, Extension Forestry Specialist. Thanks to our phone volunteers, the folks from the Brookings Area Master Gardeners, and thanks to you for watching and calling in. On behalf of the entire crew, have a good evening and happy gardening. Funding for Garden Line is provided in part by your membership and the Friends of South Dakota Public Broadcasting. And by Swiftel Communications.